Um, hello everyone, my name is Caitlin Dewey. I'm the food policy reporter here at the Washington Post. Post. And uh, with me on stage today, we have some really wonderful guests. Uh, we have Ken Cook, who is the president and co-founder of the Environmental Working Group. Uh, Dr. Marty Matlock is in the middle there. He is the executive director of the University of Arkansas's Office for Sustainability. He is also a professor of ecological engineering in the university's biological and agricultural engineering department. And on the end, we have Veronica Nye. She is an economist at the American Farm Bureau Foundation. Federation. What is it? Federation. Federation. We have a foundation, so it's fair. <laughs> it I work with you guys all the time, so it's <laughs> shameful that I don't know what your acronym stands for. Um, a reminder to everyone that um, you can tweet your questions and comments to us using the hashtag post live. I have this handy iPad here, so I'll be checking that and we'll be sure to ask the panelists any of the questions you guys may have. Um, so here we are, we're talking about um, you know, food security and sustainability over the next 30, 50, 100 years. A figure that we tend to see all the time in our field, right, is that by 2050, we'll need to feed 9 billion people. How in the world are we going to do that with all these enormous challenges that we face? Um, you guys represent some different perspectives and, and disciplines looking at that question. So I wanted to ask each of you to kick off you know, what you would sort of consider to be a top policy priority for, for addressing this challenge of you know, how are we going to sustainably feed so many new people. Veronica, you want to start? Sure. Ladies first. Sure. Uh, well, I, I think from the, uh, from the farmer's perspective, um, we represent about 6 million members. Uh, we're a general farm organization that has membership in all uh, 50 states in Puerto Rico. I think from the overarching per, uh, wish of our members is for there to be enough policy room for multiple food systems to be able to work together. Um, you can't solve all food issues with one particular policy perspective. It's going to take um, a lot of different systems working together, I think, in order to solve some of the issues that we have in the United States, uh, which are different than issues we have in other countries. Um, and then there's issues that sort of um, run the, the gauntlet across all countries. So um, making sure that we aren't so prescribed in how we do things uh, that we, d we lose the ability to be flexible and serve a different consumers. Very Farm Bureau of you, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Very Farm Bureau. Um, we'll go to the good doctor next. Certainly, when we talk about food security, we're really talking about access, so, <laughs> persistent access, reliable access to nutritious, quality food in a, in a way that, that is valuable to the community, to the family, to the people who are consuming it. Uh, so we have to separate, I think, we need to separate affluent food consumption from what I will call subsistent food consumption, the, the food that's necessary to sustain the body. And we have to recognize that we still have 890 million of our brothers and sisters who are chronically malnourished in the world today. And the prospect that that's going to get become lower as a number in the next 30 years is pretty dim. We're looking at we're now experiencing one of the worst famines in Sudan and Somalia and other parts of Africa that we've seen since World War II. Yet we are mostly blissfully ignorant of it, unlike uh, previous famines. Famine is amongst us now, and it is expanding as a function of policy, political action, dysfunction, as well as climate change. The fact is climate change is driving food scarcity around the planet and will continue to disrupt food supplies around the planet. So let's separate prosperity food consumption, because those of us who have money can always buy, from those who are on the edge, on the margins. So when we talk about food security, we really need to focus there, because that's where, that's where children die. That's where people suffer. Our challenge, I think, is to understand that, that those of us who live in the prosperous economies of the world don't understand the difficulties of what it means to go, hungry, go to bed hungry, to wake up with your children hungry, and not know where their food's going to come from. Aldo Leopold, in the introduction to San County Almanac, said we could little about cons conservationism. We could little worry about these things natural until we didn't have to worry about where our breakfast came from. So if we care about the natural world, if we care about biodiversity, we have to care about making sure that those least among us are fed. And that's the challenge of food security in the 21st century. Well, I, I agree with my, with my 
colleagues on the panel, um, and if, just to weave it together maybe a little bit, you do need a diverse approach into thinking about policy, in part because of the two, at least two very different perspectives on, uh, on sustainability. And, you know, uh, if you had to put your finger on one issue that uh, would probably be central to attacking uh, the general problem of, of hunger now in the world, it's, it's income inequality. It's the fact that, it's not the fact that we don't have the food. We have excessive amounts of certain grains and other commodities now. We have, have petitioners before Congress uh, asking for uh, income transfers from taxpayers to farmers because we've grown too much of certain things, produced too much of certain things in this country, and there are examples of that uh, elsewhere in the developed world. But in those countries where, where poverty makes it impossible for people ha to have the power to purchase food, uh, that, that requires something more than just uh, technology or even food policy per se. It, re it really requires economic policy and an understanding that uh, we have an integrated economy around the world to a degree, but we have these vast populations in developing countries and uh, they, they really are not going to be able to take advantage of the type of food supply that is being built even now uh, if they don't have the income to do it. I mean, famines, uh, you know, a Nobel Prize was awarded for this. Famines are caused by uh, not the uh, unavailability of food, but uh, by hoarding and other practices that come about uh, because of income inequality. And famines, at least in India uh, and, and elsewhere, uh, tend to happen in rural areas where there's food. Yep. Interesting. Yeah, I think Mark Bittman put it best, right? He said the question isn't how to feed the nine billion, it's how to end poverty, right? It sounds yeah, like what exactly you guys are right. saying. Yeah. yeah. Could, could I just clarify that I agree with absolutely with what my colleague said, but we have to recognize in every county in the United States we have food insecurity. Mm -hmm. And in our southern states, I live in Arkansas, in our southern states we have some counties where we have 30% of the households who are food insecure based on the definition I gave, which we would apply generally to a developing country. That's in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quite so. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, you know, I, I know you guys mentioned climate change in passing. We have a, a question from the Good Food Institute on Twitter. Uh, they said, how do you guys think technology can be used to address the environmental problems of animal agriculture, is what they said, since that's their interest issue. But I'm going to say, how about agriculture, industrial agriculture more generally? I mean, what sort of solutions do technology, does technology offer for you know, things like greenhouse gas emissions, runoff, all those things? I'll start again, as you guys let me. Uh, yeah. It's always dangerous to give someone a microphone in DC. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I think what we've we've been seeing the last several, uh, well, actually since the beginning of agriculture, is that we're always striving to improve technology to use our resources better, and that continues today. I think about. Uh, Irrigation is an excellent example. A few decades ago, we did a lot of overhead spray irrigation. And today, you see increased adoption of drip irrigation line to utilize those uh, scarce resources uh, better and to grow, to grow more with the resources that we have. And uh, what I'd mention in that space, though, is a lot of the technologies that have come out um, over the last some, some odd years are, are quite expensive. Um, and it takes a certain... Um, it takes a certain level of, of income and uh, revenues from a farm in order to be able to support the purchase of those type of technologies. Uh, it was mentioned in the last panel that we need to continue to increase agricultural research. Um, and I think you see that as a need both in, in the smallholder space in the United States and around the world. The different technologies don't fit every farm the same. So uh, continuing to address uh, additional research uh, on all of those spaces is, is helpful. Um, precision technology is something that our members have been very excited about over the years. Um, things like GPS uh, tracking, which is uh, 
more precise on our on our tractors than it is on our phones, and um, it, it got me to the post today really easy. So imagine how uh, how good that tractor is that it allows us to make sure that we're applying the right amount of product um, to the correct soil to the. Uh, to understand really all the agronomic needs of an individual plants, individual rows, rather than doing sort of this broad stroke application of resources. So uh, that's something that we're going to continue to do. Uh, we need public research, we need private research in order to meet uh, the needs all across the space. If you want to see how technology has dramatically changed agriculture since 1984, I'm quite a bit older than that, so in well into my lifetime, my professional career, go to fieldtomarket.com, the Alliance for Sustainable Agriculture, Field to Market's a multi-stakeholder collection of, of conservation organizations and agriculture producers and allied industries. We've been analyzing these processes using life cycle assessment for the last several years. Look at the national report, and you'll see that in many cropping systems, we have reduced erosion by 30 to 40 percent, in some cases 60 percent over the last 40 years, 35, 40 years. We've reduced, reduced greenhouse gas emissions per unit area and per unit uh, crop produced. We've gotten a lot better, but largely because the things that we're trying to make better, we have to pay for. They have value. They have economic value. What's happening now is that our agricultural community is engaging with our conservation organizations and other uh, civil society organizations to identify what other things that are non-monetized we need to make, get, make better. Uh, I work with the metrics group for the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef Production, and we're looking at how beef producers can manage water quality on the lands, can manage biodiversity on the lands, can reduce soil erosion on the lands, and increase efficiency in production. That's, so that's happening today, and it's not a federal agency leading this. It's not a federal government initiative. This is all farmer-led, producer-led, supply chain-led initiatives. But to give a foreshadow, a shout out to the coming panel, the one that comes up after us in the next 20 minutes, it doesn't matter how efficient you are at the production at getting products to the consumer's table if they throw 40% of it away once they get it. 40%. So I don't care how technologically advanced we become if you throw almost half of it away at the end. It's all a waste. No, I, I, again, I think that's right. Um, you know, there, there, it is difficult um, to talk about climate change in some agricultural settings. Uh, just the, the, the politics have bled into it, and it's and it's become um, it's become a topic that unfortunately is not is not seen at this stage in, in some in some circles as um, as a scientific or environmental discussion as a, as a political one. So I, I hope we can I hope we can continue to make progress there and. Uh, I think probably the best way to, to make progress might, might be to talk about the other benefits of the technologies we're, we're talking about, uh, whether it's uh, improving yields, reducing the area that we need, um, whether it's uh, f food waste, uh, which some is tech, a technological fix, some of it's just uh, behavioral changes that we need to get used to. And if we have a, a tightening of the, the economy, that, that's the fastest way for people to learn how to not waste food. But I think from a, from a technology standpoint, the, the place where I feel like we're uh, investing uh, poorly is in the technologies that will help some of these developing countries make a difference where they are in, in providing food production. Uh, we're just uh, not uh, on the same path we were some decades ago. Uh, there have been criticisms of the Green Revolution, and I, I, I agree with, with some of them. But there was a, a much stronger presence in international agricultural research for smallholder and large uh, operations alike a couple of decades ago. And that has withered for lack of, of support uh, beyond a point where I think uh, we, we have the ability we need to have to develop not necessarily you know, very highly sophisticated and expensive technology, but some, some basic things like uh, plant breeding for localized conditions and um, education of farmers and proper soil nutrition and uh, and so forth. So we've really shortchanged ourselves there. That's going to hamper us. Hmm. So this is sort of fascinating, and maybe it's a product of how I frame the question. But I have three agricultural people up here, and none of you mentioned biotechnology. I mean, is it going to be possible to address some of these environmental challenges while increasing yields? without the, the help of gen genetically engineered and genetically edited crops. You're already shaking your head. Jump in for me. 
we, we've been biotechnologically modifying crops by selective breeding for 10,000 years. We are using, we use some pretty crude tools in the 90s. We now have very explicit tools now, and there's risk with every change we make, whether it's crossbreeding a plant, whether it's hybridizing a plant. Hybrid corn was a disruption in agricultural production in the 1920s and 30s. The notion that you couldn't save your seed corn from hybrid corn and grow them the next year because they wouldn't, they're after hybrids, they won't produce. So that was just an absolute uh, abomination until the benefits of hybrid corn emerged in the producers, for the producers. So we are facing an opportunity and a challenge with understanding and communicating the benefits and risk and managing the benefits and risk I think Dr. Merrigan addressed this in the previous panel, of this new technology, CRISPR technology among others, of gene editing. We're not gonna be able to create a crop that can grow food without water. That's just silly. Or with, uh, without nutrients, that's just silly. But what we can do is we can increase disease resistance, we can increase drought resistance so that our yield penalties are less. We can do things on the margin that take the edge off the risk of the producers. But let's go back to this issue also of the, of the small scale producer in Eastern Africa. If we can take her farm, it's almost always her, if we can take her two hectares of corn and we can double her yield, double her yield, we have made her now from trans, transition from a subsistence producer to an economic marketplace dis, uh, producer, which means she has extra, mm -hmm. extra so that her children can go to school, extra that she, so she can buy equipment, irrigation equipment perhaps, or better heating for a different stove for cooking in the house. That's the way you move people from with using land-based prosperity from poverty to prosperity from the land. You don't do it by vilifying the technology in the toolbox. The toolbox is just a toolbox. A hammer is an incredibly good tool or a weapon, depending on how it's used. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I think that's right. Uh, you know, just just as the the, the tools that were fashioned in the first generation of agricultural biotechnology were were pretty coarse, pretty yep. pretty crude. So is the policy framework that we erected around it, and still is. CRISPR's come along, but it's operating fundamentally in that same dilapidated, outmoded, um, to me, underregulated uh, policy environment. Uh, that I think has led to some unnecessary. Uh, debates, problems, questions about technologies that could be resolved, uh, maybe not to everyone's satisfaction, if we had, uh, I, I think, uh, the regulatory framework we need for agricultural biotechnology. You know, the debate of, of recent years has been over a, a very narrow question, fundamentally, of whether you should label. Um, but to me, the deeper question is, uh, are, are we really being as responsible as we need to be, knowing that these technologies are coming online? And uh, f from, from what we look at at, uh, at Environmental Working Group, we, we, we've concluded that the, the regulatory system really comes up short. Uh, but it's, uh, there's, there's not much support right now for, for upgrading it in a significant way. But it's a new world, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very new world. To, to that point, uh, obviously we have a, a lot of members who are um, producing biotechnology, crops from biotechnology. We have a lot of members who aren't producing crops from biotechnology. Um, but, and it's, it, there's been a lot of environmental benefits that have come as a result of, of biotech. We're, we're applying uh, a different softer chemicals than we used to. We're applying uh, lower levels of, of, of lots of them. But, it, and the science continually is, is, is pretty conclusive that biotechnology is, is crops produced with biotechnology are just as safe as those that are not produced with biotechnology. But I think we spend a lot of time in that space, and, and for good reason, safety is important, and I'm, and I'm glad we re, re, reiterate that message. But something that's, that's really important that gets lost in that is all the opportunity to solve issues that are still out there that we haven't been able to fix with other technologies or with other practices. Um, I'll give the example of papayas in Hawaii that were almost wiped out before biotechnology, uh, an event or allowed that to uh, to continue to grow to uh, fight off the sort of the natural uh, bug and and uh, sort of uh, pressures it was under, or or think about oranges in Florida that are currently under significant pressure uh, because of citrus screening. We've tried the tools that we already have. 
certainly farmers are, they, they're very aware of the tools that they have at their disposal. Uh, and they've been trying them on their own. They've been funding research at their universities. We've, we've certainly been trying. So why not look at this as new technology as a means to, uh, to solve some of these longstanding issues that, that, we've had, that we have? Let me pivot away from the policy for a minute and ask you guys something that I think is on the minds of a lot of consumers who are concerned about these issues, and that is, um, how do I need to change my diet to benefit the environment? You know, if if I want to support a sort of sustainable food system, agricultural model, should I be subsisting entirely on cricket flour right now? I mean, what 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 are yes. the sort of prospects yes. for that? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> well, there are there are other bugs. So it should just... Oh, what, what else do yeah. we got? No, no. <laughs> well, I mean, I think the, you know, the advice that benefits the environment is in many ways the, the same advice that, that benefits your health. Yep. Um, you know, uh, eating, eating less, uh, eating lower on the food chain, basically, more of your diet coming from, uh, from, from plants um, seems to me to be... Uh, eminently sensible and be, you know better for the environment doesn't guarantee we'll solve environmental problems doesn't guarantee it will solve health problems for an, for an individual but um, most of the evidence lines up pretty well that if you do that um, you, you're you're going to be a healthier person uh, I think most people if they if they have the the, the biometric profile of the average American and they have a a doctor who says you're eating just the right amount of meat, they, they need a new doctor. Um, we, we really do need to, to understand that and embrace that. It's, uh, it's, there's a lot of, uh, there, there's a, a lot of cultural history and uh, behavioral momentum to continue the diets we have, and that's continuing to cause problems. But I think if we, if we step back, I, I, I know what, growing up, I, had two uncles who were cattlemen. We always had a freezer full of beef. I loved it. I still, I still do. Yes, I eat meat, um, but, but I eat a lot less of it, a lot less of it than I used to. And I think uh, that kind of moderation um, is is exactly the direction that uh, that that probably we need to be headed as a society. Grow your own food. If I don't care if you live in an apartment, put a window box in with some herbs. Grow your own food. You'll find out a couple of things. How hard it is, how frustrating it is, especially when the squirrels take those green tomatoes that you've been watching just before they're ready to harvest. You find out just how hard those producers who give you the, that bounty in your grocery store that you take for granted work to put it there and recognizing that the stuff that's in the grocery store is about 40% of the stuff that came off the field. That's how much waste we have before it gets to your grocery store, and the, especially in fresh produce. And so you realize just how hard it is, how valuable it is, how much time and effort it takes, and you'll be a little more forgiving of that blemish on the squash because you've grown it yourself, and you know that blemish doesn't mean a thing. It's still incredibly good food. So grow your own food. If you're not growing your own food, shut up. <laughs> I don't grow my own food, but can I go? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. uh, because I have it, I, I don't, I can't grow anything. Um, so <laughs> I've tried. She's an economist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One something that I would mention is in this space is that there's there's no unicorns and there's no unicorn food. Yeah. So there's nothing. There's no food system out there that's going to do everything for you that you want. I would make a list of the things that are important to you. Make a list of, uh, I, I, want, I want this, I want it to this, I want it to that. And some of it might be in the environmental space, some of it might be on the animal welfare side, some of it might be more uh, along who, who's growing my food. And, and make a list there and then try to uh, sort of source your, your food that meets those goals. Because uh, I think oftentimes what we have a tendency to do is to conflate uh, issues that that's it's because something is because uh, eggs are cage free they're somehow healthier or because they're because it's organic it's somehow this or that and uh, I, I think Dr. Merrigan last panel said um, there's this sort of push and pull of organic has to mean small it, it doesn't um, but it Making a list of all of those things, I think, will actually help you help consumers figure out what the food, what they actually want their food to achieve, and, and then realize that 
I am an economist. There are trade-offs with all things, and that, that unicorn food probably doesn't exist. And so um, figuring, it, figuring out that you yourself have to, to give and take um, will, would, help, would go a long way to us all figuring out how our food systems can all interact. But if you find a unicorn, I think cricket flour would be the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty tasty, too. Yeah. I think Starbucks has invented a unicorn frappuccino, if I'm not mistaken. Uh -huh. uh -huh. That's a unicorn. You have to work on a new. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the last thing I wanted to ask you guys about, you know, we're obviously at a very, let's say, interesting political moment right now, policy moment. I'm not. Um, and and I'm, I'm sort of curious, and you know, you can diverge from the, the topic of food security, sustainability, what have you. I mean, what, from your perspective, is going to be sort of the biggest food and agricultural storyline of the next four years? I mean, what's an issue that you're watching really closely? I'll start. I'm going to let somebody else start. I'm going to do clean up on this <laughs> one. Can I start? Go for it. All right. The biggest storyline is that governments aren't driving the changes and innovations we're seeing in agriculture that civil society organizations working with producers are, that supply chains are, that retailers are, that the entire agricultural supply chain has an awareness that it's all connected and it's all changing and that the risks are all interconnected. And so supply chains, branded consumer product companies recognize that they, that box that they sell you with their brand on it may have sourcing from 72 different countries. And they may not know what's all going into that box, but their reputation is tied to it. And so they're learning because they've got to manage their reputation. And what that means is there's an opportunity to have this supply chain-wide, full-scale sustainability discussion about our food and its implications on people's health when they produce it, when they can process it, when they consume it. That, and, and on ecosystem services, ecosystem processes, as well as on economics, the profitability of our farmers. That's all driven by uh, an awareness of risk at the consumer packaged good company and throughout the supply chain, not by governments. So the good news is the government doesn't matter in this space. This will continue in spite of what happens in the government. That is good news. Thank you. Do you want to go second? No. I'll go third. Okay. Thanks. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, now, th there's no question that the uh, and the previous our previous panelists um, spoke to it too. I thought very well. There's no question that the rules of the game are changing. I mean, policy's not, policy's not made the way it, it used to be made. Um, there, there's also no question, I think, that the private sector, for the, for the, ones, for the companies that are consumer facing, which many farmers, I think this is one of, the, one of the issues we have to work on together to fix. Many farmers are not consumer facing and haven't been for generations now. It used, that didn't used to be the case, but it's, it became the case with commodity agriculture. That's a, that's a missed opportunity, I think, for and a, a great source of misunderstanding that's hard to fix as long as farmers don't have that interaction and consumers don't either. I think it goes both ways. I do think policy is more important uh, in, in some areas, though. I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the upcoming Farm Bill uh, debate that's already underway. I'm very worried about the uh, the, the, the overall dimensions of uh, our, our budget situation, some of the proposals that are out there. I mean, some, have, some that came from uh, the administration were declared dead by the administration within 48 hours. Um, so I'm not sure why we went through that exercise, but if you look at some of the, some of the ideas embedded in it, um, they're, they're worrisome. I think uh, big cuts to the SNAP program um, is, is a big deal. Um, I think the fact that we uh, were a couple billion dollars short in the money we would need to continue some very important farm bill programs forward, uh, a lot of which, uh, Kathleen alluded to it, a lot of which deal with sustainable agriculture. Um, these, are big, these are big issues and we're going to have to work together to, to, to try and resolve them. And there have been times when we've worked together well, the, you know, the, if, if you will, the, the, the agriculture community. and. And, uh, and folks in civil society, nonprofits, and there have been times when we haven't worked together so well. I'm hoping this is going to be a time where, uh, for a variety of reasons, we come together and recognize that we've got a lot more to lose uh, than, uh, than, if we work to, uh, than if we work together and we can get, turn that in loss into some gain. Thanks. Um, and I, 
I'd point out that we are the middle panel uh, of this uh, of this whole dialogue. And what we heard in the in the first panel was very much policy driven. And I think what we're going to hear in the third panel is very much from the business perspective. And we very much operate in the space of being. Uh, our, my members are those who are operating businesses that are impacted both by consumer-driven policy and by government policy. Um, at the same time, over the last three years, net farm income has fallen by almost half. So there's a lot of con constraints going on in, in, our, in our industry as far as the ability to respond um, to trends and to consumer demands, government demands, um, and then but also having the the end that if things farm agriculture can't be sustainable if farmers aren't sustainable and part of farmers being sustainable is is staying in business so um, it, and I think we that's that's always been the problem that's always been the agricultural problem is we have ups and downs in our prices that doesn't go away uh, unfortunately but uh, moving into the in the next decade or, or and beyond it's how do we how do we do a better job of getting closer to a solution where we're moving towards the social and the consumer uh, changes, but also making sure that, that farmers are, are also there at the table and, and helping to solve the problem and, and staying in business in the, in, in the short, medium, and long term. Awesome. Well, Veronica, you got the last word there, and it was a good one. Um, that's all the time we have for today, but thank you so much to all three of you for being part of this conversation. Thank you. Well done.